welcome everyone here today. I think um, you're going to get a lot out of this workshop. Um, Linda has been working very, very hard, as you can see by the binder, to uh, develop a lot of uh, great materials and great resources and an excellent presentation for everyone. Just curious to know um, how many of you were able to attend the January uh, professional development workshop where we talked about this course before it had a name? Oh, okay. quite a few people. Um, that's great. So this is going to be both a continuation, and, um, but also if you weren't there, I'm sure um, you'll be able to get a sense of uh, where we're going with this great new uh, integrated reading and writing course. Um, as well as really get some serious nuts and bolts today about how to move forward with a course like this. Um, this time, I would love to welcome President Spraga, who um, took time out of his schedule to come and see all of us today. Um, Thank you for yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. <coughs> welcome. I'm sorry I'm fighting a cold, so I gotta keep my throat uh, wet. Uh, but uh, I thank you all for giving up some of your valuable time to uh, be here, and I thank Deb for her great leadership in uh, this general project. Uh, you know, the college has invested uh, considerably uh, in you, right? Uh, and in our developmental and uh, math as well. Uh, <clears throat> and Deb has done a terrific job in bringing it all together, all of the research that we, uh, that we have uh, accomplished. And uh, it is for the betterment of our students. Uh, uh, you know, there are, you, I think you know, but I certainly know, I hear about it all the time. We get a lot of pressure from Boston and Washington about uh, developmental education, why we even doing it, and uh, what's it done to long and higher education, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we have uh, Beth Donovan, I believe, in uh, math, uh, kind of coordinating the activities uh, in developmental math, and uh, and Deb is doing a fabulous job uh, in, in our reading and writing. Uh, so uh, the importance of it, I always say, my answer to them is, I say, why are we doing it? Is it uh, the glory of the open door. What are we going to do? Uh, slam the window in their on their hands and just say you're not welcome here, and uh, you're writing off a whole segment of society. You know the registrations that we have. That's the demand that's out there. So I just it's just unconscionable that we would uh, uh, close our doors uh, to them, and uh, there's no opportunity here. That that uh, sometimes I get I get the feeling that's what happens in Europe and uh, and Japan and China as well. Uh, that they spend the whole uh, career, a lifetime, uh, whittling away people. So yes, you get uh, absolutely cream of the crop. Uh, that, but that's they're the only people left standing. And uh, uh, I'm I'm thinking of uh, move, uh, I've been asked, invited to make a presentation in Cape Verde about the value of a community college. I, I made one recently to them, and they seem very excited about it. But economic development, and you. And uh, uh, anybody that you know, suffers from chronic unemployment and uh, 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 social costs of, of uh, illiteracy, right? you know, that bumper sticker. I'm getting a little bit off track here, but I want to thank uh, Deb for uh, uh, moving us forward with this. This is uh, uh, the result, I, I'm going to say the result, I know Deb would say is still in progress, but it's the result of the, that considerable investment that the college made. And, uh, uh, I want you to know that we feel that everyone at the college feels the same way. This is too important uh, to uh, not to pay great attention to. And uh, I thank you for giving up your time. Your, your presence here makes that statement as well. Uh, I'm sorry I'm, uh, for JP's loss and we'll miss uh, tomorrow's, but uh, we're going to reschedule that. We're going to try to do it next week. Yeah. Um, and I'll get an email out to everyone as soon as he gets back to Massachusetts and I'm able to touch base with him. Hoping for next Wednesday, but it really depends on what we can do. And the uh, the last Center for Teaching and Learning has done uh, wonderful work with that new faculty seminar. So we have an uh, influx of uh, new faculty coming in, and uh, Suzanne Buglioni and uh, uh, everyone is uh, working with that. I think it's a best practice that uh, that uh, new faculty seminar, and good things happen. Uh, wings of did you graduate? Did you fail or anything? Are you passed the whole thing? <laughs> okay. Still got to get that last paper in, right? <laughs> but it really is a remarkable uh, uh, activity at the college, and I think it sends a message across the state as to what we can do and what, what can be done if you, uh, if you devote your resources to the main thing, right? Instruction, instructional support. So thank you, Deb. I wish you well. I'm sorry I can't stay. I've got more mundane things to do than uh, what you'll be dealing with. But uh, 
Uh, I wish you well, and I hope to see you uh, at the second one as well. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, very quickly, before Jen Deborah Mitchell leaves, I just want to say um, she deserves a round of applause for setting everything. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> and Suzanne um, Leone, um, who uh, gave us all the resources to do all of this um, great organizational work for today. I really appreciate it. Um, now, it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Morrow, the Dean of Developmental Education and TRIO programs, and she will introduce our presenter today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I actually wrote notes, because there's so much to say about Linda Moore. <laughs> oh, no, that's good or but, bad. <laughs> before I begin, I'd like to echo everything uh, that President Sprague said about Debbie Anderson, and also Betsy French's work with the Presidential Fellows and the team and all the faculty who started up um, and made this all happen. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce Linda Mulready today. Um, every, she's well known to most of you, but she's been a, a tenured and seasoned faculty of reading and English for many, many years here teaching developmental and college level courses uh, in a variety of settings, as you know, both the Quest Lab settings, CDE lectures, face-to-face, -face, hybrid and online modes, and she often employs best practices like supplemental instruction for the betterment of her students and their outcomes in her classes. She's always on the cutting edge of different strategies that will improve those outcomes. And her work as a presidential fellow on the accelerated reading and writing courses is just the most recent example of her notable contributions to pedagogy at the college. She's getting embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> but her work is always characterized by excellence, by her rigor, by her thoughtfulness, and by her integrity. She is, in my experience as the Dean of Division VI, always one of the ones that you want at the table when you're embarking on a new initiative. And what all the fellows and the faculty who have been involved in these courses have accomplished is really remarkable and full of promise um, for improved student learning. But because of Linda's special brand of gravitas and, <laughs> <laughs> and insight and expertise, I know that you will find her presentation oh, God, most I don't know today. Well, please welcome. All right. Well, that's a big build-up. I don't know about that. Um, so I'm, I want to welcome you all here too and I want to say how wonderful it is to have so many people here interested in this particular course. Um, what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to do is um, sort of tell you what uh, I planned for the beginning uh, part of the morning and then maybe we can go around and introduce ourselves because I know that you have name tags or name plackets which is very nice but I don't know all of you either I know I think there's some adjuncts that I haven't met anyways what I think um, am I uh, what I can offer for you today all right remember this is really the first workshop that we've had that really is going to deal with the nuts and bolts of this course so there's some things that we, I can offer you and we can discuss, as you can see in the packet. But I do want to um, have you aware that I'm aware that there's a lot of things surrounding this course that we're not going to be able to cover today. And so there may be certain issues that you would like to discuss that we just can't get to that certainly surrounds this course. Um, I just returned last week. I went to the ALP conference in Baltimore, which um, is a conference about this course and the course that JP will present on. And um, there I'll offer some new things that I found out there that aren't necessarily in your packet. I also have one additional handout that I got from there that I thought I would share with you today. But a lot of the new materials that came from that, co from that conference this year were about issues that were related to this course, but not necessarily necessarily um, curriculum related. So I know that at the end of the presentation, Deb has a little evaluation sheet, and you can put um, other suggestions for future workshops that you would like for this particular course. All right, so what I'd like to do is, you've heard my introduction, is to sort of go around and just say who we are. I know there's a lot of people here about who we are and um, maybe what our association is to BCC so that I can know all of you too as well. So can we have that? Hello. Um, my name is Joanne Lyons and I teach developmental reading at 
Division Six class. Sue Foreman, uh, I teach English 090 and 101. Karen Chan, um, adjunct faculty, English 090, 101, and 102. Uh, Tom Grady, uh, English faculty, uh, 90, 101, and 102. Okay. You want to come over here, Betsy? Sure. Um, Betsy from French, and um, English 90, 101, 102, and in the past I've taught reading as well. Catherine and Demwitz, uh, English, 090, 101, 102, and uh, I'm the coordinator as well. Kevin Forgard, I'm an instructional designer here working with Title III and uh, Center for Teaching and Learning. Mary Beth Rule Larson, and I teach both the reading courses and the uh, English. Sally Gav, I'm an Quest reading specialist, and I have uh, taught um, both reading 090 as adjunct. Sarah Morrill, and I'm adjunct faculty yep. in English, and I've taught. Oh, yes, you are. One. That's right. I know. Mm -hmm. We go over there, that lady in the striped shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Hansen, I'm an associate professor of ESL at Reading Division 6. Jackie Berry, I'm reading faculty in ESL. Vera Beeb, and I teach uh, English 090. Patricia Stillman, I teach the developmental adjunct, I teach the developmental reading program as well as um, ESL 123 uh, CSS. Jan Baptist, retired director of disability services on <laughs> the reading faculty, and I also teach psych 101. Yep. What if we go to the back, to the, to the uh, newbie? Oh, to uh, I teach English 090, 101. Um, I'll be teaching 092 this semester. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm Bill Lawrence. I teach uh, English faculty. I teach uh, 090, 101. I'm Hilly French, uh, no relation to Betsy. I am. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, the learning specialist for the Quest Writing Lab. A lot of guys know English 090, 101, 102. Brian McGuire, English 190, 101, 102. Okay, hi, Brian. I don't know. Kathy Driscoll, I teach reading adjunct, I teach reading 090, and English. Okay. I'm Elizabeth Paul, and I teach mostly in the middle college program. I teach, um, I did teach English this semester. I teach mostly reading CSS, and I've taught psychology also. Yeah, Peter. Peter Sawyer, I teach 101 and 090, and reading. Okay. Turn around. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Now, I would like you to introduce you to my class that, as you know, I'm also going to offer you advice because I did teach this one section of this particular course um, in the spring. And so um, here are some members of my class up here in the picture. And I know that you have this picture here. So over here is, my, uh, is a picture of myself. And I, those of you that know me know that this is like so, so me in the classroom. And Deb came in and she took this picture and I, I thought like, oh, she really captured what I do because here I am at the front, you know, blah, 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 blah. and then in the background, I don't know if you can see it or not, but is the blackboard, which I, those of you who have seen me teach know that I put like the, the night's assignments, you know, like right over in the corner, right away, and, and students write it down. And so it was just funny. I thought it was hysterical that she actually got a picture of that up there. Over here is um, Claudia. Claudia is a returning student, a mother of two, and um, this was her first semester back at school and here at BCC. Over here are two students. Some of you know this one right here. This is Jose. Jose is the vice president, was he, of the International Club and a second language student. He was the youngest student in the class. And as you can see, he's very concentrating on his writing. But that is because the young ladies in the class would beep, 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 Jose, Jose, Jose. So Jose would just like try to block himself out and just leave me alone, let me write. So this is what Jose tried to do, you know, to sort of ward off their advances. But <laughs> he loved, I'll tell you some other funny stories about Jose and me and myself. Um, but he was very, very sweet and, and an excellent student. Next to him is Luz. She's from Puerto Rico. 
she's again a returning student. This was her first semester here and a mother of three. And I think of Diane because she was one of these. I don't think so, miss. You know, at the beginning of the class. <laughs> At the beginning of the class, but you're going to read her paper in the second half of the class, one of her essays, essay three. And she became really a leader of the class, and I really hope she's returning because she's really somebody that we need to sort of mentor. Eventually, she did. Over here, we have Sandra. Sandra was hearing impaired, so um, you know I, we got to work with student in this particular first section and accommodations with um, that particular um, disability through the ODS office. Over here is the, her C-print captioner who accompanied her to all the classes. So um, those are the students that finished the class. I do want to tell you, we had a very small class. Because it was a first section, it was the spring. And so there were some other students that didn't actually get to the end of it all. But there is my class. And over here is a brief in, uh, you know, description of the course itself taken from the um, handouts in the publication handouts that Debbie made. I'm going to work off of the computer here. These are Word documents, all right? So I'm going to have to go and sort of click them through because I kept them in Word rather than try to transfer them in PowerPoint because most of them are handouts that were already in Word. So um, we just did that. So you're going to have to give me like a little minute here and I'll, I'll get that up. I think I can see it. All right, so what I have next, and I'm going to go, going to go along with... Um, the uh, sort of booklet that you have there. Um, and I know that Deb has a schedule here for you. And to just sort of review that again, and then we'll go on here, that this is what um, I think we'll do for part one. And as I said for part one, what I'm going to do is have it sort of um, me giving you information. But if you have any questions, you know, I, I work in a very informal way. So if you have some questions on any of the handouts or any of the information I'm going to give you, just, just ask. I know we're a large group, but we certainly can answer any questions that you have. So I'm going to give you an overview of the course um, as I taught it, all right? And then what I'll do the, as we get in, uh, closer to the break is give you some specific lessons and quizzes and assignments that I actually very specifically gave. Um, then the second half, I have a student writing sample for us to look at, Lucy's sample, and I have a little activity I thought we could do with that. And then if we have time to maybe see after I give you some information and you have a reading selection um, in front of you, what kind of lessons you might create, you know, given the instructions in the course. So we'll see how that works. We're, we can certainly change it up if you want. All right. The, um, so what I'd like to start with here is the, no, I gotta close this out, is the um, description of the course, which I know that um, some of you have seen and some of you have not seen. This is and uh, the description that we gave to um, CWCC, and I think they're going to act on it in the fall, right, Deb and Betsy? Yeah. yeah yes. So this has already been given, um, and this was obviously not what we started with at the beginning of the semester because we didn't. We worked on this during the semester. At the beginning of the semester. Um, there was an imp called an implementation team that met weekly, which consisted of myself and Betsy and JP and Debbie. And so we also had a lot of notes, if you remember, from the January meeting that um, uh, Farah, I know, facilitated the one I was in. And people took notes about what you would like to have this course say and be in the course. So at the beginning of the semester, when I made the syllabus and we began working on this actual description, those are the notes that we used. So we used what you gave us in January, and Janine helped us. And I saw her at that conference, and she asked for all of you. She particularly asked for Deb, because uh, she had seen Deb a few weeks earlier. But she was, again, most helpful um, to anybody that was there. And, and she did an excellent job for us as well. So. Over the semester, we tweaked um, the notes that you had given us, and of course, all the college-type 
uh, things that had to be in here as far as prerequisites. And we came up with this particular description, which is before CWCC um, as we speak. And then the student learning outcomes, of course, which they um, require, we, we, we tweaked those as well. Now, I think, and you know, Betsy and Debbie can chime in if you want. As we were describing this course, what we were looking for was to make it integrated, because the topic is integrated reading and writing. So we didn't want to make it sound that it was one thing or the other, but that it was an integration of both. We also kind of wanted to add some things that would, have, would bump it up a little bit. Um, and so we see some MLA citation information in there in the course description. And we also um, had it be a theme-based course. And I know there was some discussion about this. But when I re went to ALP this last week, all across the country, this is how they're functioning and doing this course in a theme-based way. Now, and as I'll talk to you about some other ways they're doing it, not just the way I did it. Um, there are other ways to do this course, and it's not that it has to be the way I'm going to show you. But they're all theme-based, and I think that holds the student's attention better, keeps the course somewhat coherent, puts things in a context rather than separate skills. So I think that was a good, good thing to leave in. I taught it that way, and I've, you know, I think that I would, I'm going to teach it again that way. So I don't know if you had any comments on this particular item. It's not that we can change anything right now, but if you're going to teach the course, this would be at the moment what you would work off of. Yeah, yeah I just want to say that I think that the outline of the, of the learning, of the outcomes is really excellent because it really clarifies both the, the reading skills and, and um, processes and protocols and the writing. Yeah, we tried hard to do that. We get a lot from the notes, though, that, you know, that came out of that January workshop. And we do see that some of them are pulled out writing and separate reading skills. But the thrust of the beginning of it is to integrate them. But as I'll show you and talk some, a little bit about how you can do skills-based instruction without making it a skills-based course. But I think it needed to be in there you yeah. know, to, to satisfy. And it came out of the workshop that we did in January. So you know, we tried that. I'm going to show you what I did as far as theme based and even though because I just came back from the conference so I don't have I only have one handout that I actually could give you but I'll talk to you and I'll tell you about what other people in other parts of the country did with that because um, it's not always what I'm going to show you so I think you have a lot of freedom to, to do this and not have to do exactly the same thing as everybody else so and, and I can give you some handouts once I go through all the ALP things. Let me just chime in for a second. A lot of the textbooks here, Jan, and I brought a couple extra. OK, yep, I have some over here, too. Organized and being yeah. reading. Mm -hmm. And they're really helpful when you're putting that together. So that's, that's I think a lot will depend. This, I think, is, good, is a, a good general outline that you can work with and, and use your own teaching skills. And a lot will depend on what kind of a book you choose or what materials you choose for your course. And I have a list, and we'll talk about that. And I have an additional list that I found at ALP that other people around the country use. That I, and we have some here for you to look at, not all of them. And I do want to tell you, publishers are, are, are sort of creating things as we speak because they, they know this is sort of what's going on. They want, of course, get in to the monetary end of it. So there may be a lot of different things coming out this summer or next year that you know, we want to keep our eye on for textbook type things, or book thing, books in general, readers. Well, I think that we put that down in sort of inherent. We talked about that, and I'll show you how I do vocabulary development. But I think we discussed it as being inherent in con comprehension, and that we didn't want to have a separate skills-based vocabulary unit that sort of goes against the grain of the course. I'll show you what I did when I, for vocabulary development. And it, I did it because the students asked me for it. So I did it in a way that matched the context. But we didn't really, we thought that if the student could summarize and th synthesize, then their vocabulary was, at, you know, was adequate and the teacher could handle 
whatever vocabulary needs the student had as needed. So we didn't put that in there. Doesn't mean you couldn't do it. Okay, and I'll show you how I did it. It doesn't mean any of that. It's just we didn't see it as a learning outcome, it not incorporated into something else. Yeah. Oh, is that? Yeah, Deb. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if we could talk a little bit. I'm curious to know, because um, I haven't spoken to you since you come back from Baltimore, but I'm curious about what you're learning about prereqs at other places. Because our prereqs are pretty specific for this course. Yeah. It's, I think it varied widely. I can't remember a lot of the questions came up. Some colleges still don't have developmental ed as a prereq to anything. No, I mean like the, like I know in Baltimore it's self-select. Yes, so oh, oh, oh. Any specific prereq to get into the course? Yes. But we do, and I, I think Do you know what, I think a lot of the, the yeah, a lot of the people that were there had not yet done the course. They were like I was, Farrah and I went last year. They're like we were last summer. So they weren't really asking those kinds of questions. Um, the, what, the people that were presenting were still mainly from California and Baltimore. So they had all that set up already. So I don't know the answer to you. I think most of the other people that I met there were from other parts of the country were still exploring and not yet doing you know, the course. So maybe they, I don't think they knew yet. Because I think one thing that we're, we're likely to do that um, we didn't manage to integrate in writing at this point is some of the ESL um, questions where, you know, for ESL students when they go into reading 090, um, they don't have to have that cut score for CPT. And I think that would apply here as well. But we haven't been as overt about it as I think we should be. So um, fingers crossed when this goes for CWCC, I anticipate a revision coming after to make that little tweak. Yeah. Any I, other tweaks that there might be that other things, be yeah. Necessary. But that's one I, I feel like I know already. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So the next thing that we're going to set, any comments on that? What I have here, the next uh, thing in your packet is something that, again, Janine um, Williams suggested and I thought was a good idea. And I, she calls it guiding principles. And that's what I called it as well. She still had this in her presentation when I saw her last week. Um, you know, she did a presentation, and I, I sort of made up these guiding principles. They're not Janine's. They're ones that she, you know, she sort of held to and I tweaked it. And these guiding principles, along with the learning outcomes that we had worked out, were kind of what drove my instruction. And so every time I would think of what kind of lesson am I going to plan, because remember, we're doing this from scratch. I had no idea. Uh, very few models, some things Janine had told us you know, our conversations with Betsy and the group, but we sort of, I sort of had to remember what the course was about. So I constantly went back to the learning outcomes as we were developing them, and I also sort of made a short little version of guiding principles that made me guide and, and my activities, and sometimes I would go off the guiding principles. <laughs> and in the, in the implementation group, we would be discussing what we should do the next couple of weeks, and I would say something, and they'd look at me like, I don't think that's right. And I'd hear Janine saying in you know, a little voice, guiding principles, go back to the guiding principles. So she was right, uh, all right, she was right. So here are the ones that I kind of worked off of, and they may get tweaked you know, as you develop your course. But to remember, it's not a skills-based course. All right, it's not made to be a skills-based course. We wanted to teach it not as a skills-based course. Around the country, it's not taught as a skills-based course. So we don't do week one, main idea. Week two, paragraph writing. Week three, you know, implied main idea. Let's underline now the patterns. Don't do that. So that's sort of not as the main guiding principle of the course. Okay, so I had to keep reminding myself about that. Um, also inherent in the course and in the literature that we studied when we did the fellowship was that these, this course was meant to practice college level assignments. And so that's sort of part of the pedagogy of the course, that the assignments you give the students are, are reflective of the ones that they sometimes are doing. You have to remember that. Jose was taking Intro to Psych with Phyllis Wentworth as he was taking this course. The other students there weren't yet taking 
college level courses just because of their schedule. But you know students in reading and English 090 can be taking those courses. And if they aren't, they're taking them the next semester. So to give them assignments, reading and writing assignments, that might be more reflective of those types of readings and writings. So if you think about what they do in Intro to Psych, it's not paragraph reading, it's not writing paragraphs, it's reading articles, reading textbooks, writing essays, um, it's not individualized skills. So to think of that and design your assignments with that in mind. Um, to remember that the assignments, assessments, whatever you do in the course, because it's integrated, need to integrate reading and writing, the big assignments. Because I'll show you some little things I did that were just reading assignments or just writing assignments and you know how we did that. But the, the large assessments, if it's called integrated reading and writing, need to, do, need to do that because that's what the course says. To keep in mind the learning outcomes of the course, which we, I remember. And the last two are really, I think, what makes this course um, different from a reading standalone 090 and English 090 is that you have to remember you have them for six hours. Six hours. So you have the time. You have the time to scaffold, to conference, to support their reading and writing in the room. Okay. Now, they did seek help outside of the room, of course. They went to the writing lab, they went to Kelly, they went to the writing uh, center down here, and um, they you know, went to the reading tutors. However, a lot is done. I, we did a lot in the room. And um, I was lucky enough to have a tutor once a week, Craig, some of you know him because he graduated. He was a big hit with the ladies, too. So it's like, Craig, oh, Craig, my paragraph is, needs to be edited. So Craig will be over there, you know. And he was very gentlemanly and very cute. So, and then I had Craig, um, yes, I had Craig once a week, so that was good. And then um, twice, we met in the, this room twice a week, and then twice a week we met up in 205. So these students here, most of them were Quest students, and Kelly, you know, got, um, that information, and so when I was up in 205, I also could open the door to the writing lab up there, and we could go in there when needed to get support as well as scaffolding. So I guess I was sort of lucky that the scaffolding and support services were just kind of worked out throughout the semester, but I think that's really, really what helped them produce the type of writing that they, and reading that they did. So you can't just sort of give them the assignment and then think, oh, I'm going to give them a hard assignment, and here we go, do it. Because the theory says they're going to do it. That it doesn't change that they need the support. The issue with this course is that you have them for a lot of hours, and you can, I'll show you how we did it the first time around, work that support in. You can even work it in, I think, if you don't necessarily have, you know, the Cal you know if I wasn't in 205, we still could have done it somehow. And I'll, I'll give you a list of that. So those were my guiding principles, and I may add more you know, maybe as the semester goes on this time. Um, I think it's good to have something that you can remember and think of and focus on when you're developing assignments that are brand new. All right. The next thing that I have here is some of the nitty gritty of what the course actually looked like. I'm going to find this here. Um, this particular item here is somewhat more specific and then I'll get, you know, I'm going to go up to be a little general in course design and then I'll be a little more specific. Um, this is the general, the, over here is the general outline of the dates over here of actually what happened. <laughs> okay, this isn't what I gave them the first week. <laughs> it's not what I thought in the middle of the semester. So I thought, should I give them like the discombobulation that was the first week and the first half? Or should I like pretend that everything was all worked out? And so I, I'm, I'm pretending for you. But this is more or less what happened during the fall, the spring semester in, in reality. Um, now, what I would say to you and what Janine said, and I'm going to say again, is that if you think that the first time you're teaching it, and maybe even the second time you're teaching it, you're going to be able to know exactly what you're going to do each day, it's just not going to work out. Okay, so 
Um, I came to this, as I said, near the end, and I know that some people like to have syllabi that have all the page numbers already here and they're already going to give it out. I would just really not recommend that the first time around. I really wouldn't. And not that I do that, but I usually do it. Like I give them in English 102 particularly, I give them like five weeks out, you know, four weeks out. Um, so I thought, oh, I could do that for this course. So I started at the first week giving them, I thought, oh, I could give them four weeks out. But that didn't work. And I was like giving them an, a revised four weeks out and then a revised three weeks out. So somewhere around midterm, I just said, I just stopped because they were just so confused about what was going on. So what I think I worked out, and I'm going to do this instead, is that I gave them one week at a time, one week at a time. And I gave it to them. I met them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and so I would give them, I would make up what I was going to do the next week specifically, Wednesday night or Thursday morning. And then I would run it off and give it to them. So I just didn't know. And you have to sort of sometimes go with the flow of the class. What did they need? What did they need? Did they need a mini lesson in paragraph writing? Did they need, I don't know, and you don't know. So this worked very well for me. And I think I'm going to do, that's how I'm going to function this semester. But uh, clearly you need sort of a general idea, you know, of what, what, what is going on. Now, and the general requirements and all down here, I think would be very much dependent on what book you chose. All right, so um, this is the book that I used here. And, and during the break, and I have a list in your, in your packet of um, other books that are uh, used in this course. And I have an additional one I'm going to give you that I got from a ALP um, uh, workshop presentations, okay, that I didn't know about when we put this packet together. So I'll give that to you before you leave. Uh, this is the book I chose. It's called Viewpoints. It's over here. You can take a look at, there's a pile here, and Betsy brought some more. Um, and what this particular book is, is that I chose this because in the summer, last summer, when Farah and I went, a lot of people mentioned this book. So I looked at it, and it's certainly um, a good guide and a good, uh, it worked very well, so I'm going to use it again. It's a reader. The, however, in the, fir the beginning of the book, the first cha one chapter is about writing skills and one chapter is about reading skills, and then the rest of the book are reading selections thematically based. So um, that's where I got the names of the themes, too. I didn't make them up. I just went with the book. There are more in here, obviously, than I need, so I picked four. I think four was an actual very good number, but it depends on the length of the reading in your book. You know, maybe you'd have two, maybe, I don't know, you'd have to sort of decide what you would like. Uh, we, I had four separate units, four different themes, four readings for each unit, and that worked very well. It wasn't too much, it wasn't too little, and it moved in a good, in a good pace. But you can look at the length of them, you know, they're not particularly long, so I was able to do that with this particular unit. Um, now, I do want to mention that as far as choosing materials, one thing I did, again, find at the ALP conference is that Katie Hearn, who's the California director of their project that's like this, has on her website, and I think I have the link at the, in the la near the end of your booklet to her, the California Acceleration Project website, where she has lots of information. But one thing that she showed us in her workshop and that was just posted is criteria for um, teachers to judge material for this type of course. And it was quite lengthy, um, but it was, uh, she showed it to us, it's online, I didn't print it out, but if you go to the California Acceleration Project website and you look for um, how to judge materials for the course or something like that, I think you'll find it. She had just added it and she showed it to us and you know her workshop was about discussing that. So it's like guidelines for teachers um, who are new to this, this type of course and want to choose reading material of any kind. And I do want to tell you also that it doesn't necessarily need to be a book. Um, I'll give you some information. Some people use one main book and they supplement it with their own handouts, assignments. Um, and some people just use their own assignments. Um, or they use selected chapters from books. So it's a wide, wide variety of what people do around the country. Okay, so this is just what, what I chose to do. 
So I had four theme-based units, if we go up here and look, I want my little pointer here, four theme-based units, there were four readings in each unit, at the end of each unit I had an in-class exam and I'll show you that one sample of what the exam really actually looked like later on. Um, and this got me five formal writing assignments. And by formal writing assignments, I mean typed MLA essay <coughs> type assignments. Um, one for each unit, and at the end, um, I had a reflection letter before they left, um, which is not an essay type letter, but they, got, they did that. And then a final exam at the, in, during final exam week. So those were like the major grades. And so I didn't put how I weighed them because everyone can just sort of do it their own way. So uh, what I got was four, really four revised, the, the reflection letter we didn't work on quite as much because it was the last week, but four drafted revised essays that integrated reading and writing. Three of which had MLA citations in them. So they, they can do it, <laughs> they can do it. Um, and I did not belong to the portfolio assessment project this past semester, but I am next semester. So those will be the ones that will go into their portfolio assessment. So. I was going to say, I, I got to observe in this class this semester, and I really liked her in-class exams because it just asked students to do another, really practice another type of writing that they have to do a lot. And so, um, you know, the in-class exams, I think, had, you know, the their answers were anywhere from one to three. I have yes. a sample, yeah, we'll yeah. look at that, yeah. But that, because they had to do that after each unit, I think they became better at They became much sample. better at it, too. So I'll um, show you how I did that. That, that again, was, nice. was Janine's suggestion. Um, and so we have, it, the in-class exam is writing. Everything is writing. There's no, I did not give an objective anything. It's all writing. They wrote the answers to the homework questions. They wrote out the answers to the exams. They wrote out the answers to the quizzes. Because it's reading and writing integrated, I, I just didn't do any objective anything. So uh, they, consequently, I think they got used to writing. Yes. And it was not an issue. They just did it. Uh, there was not a lot of resistance to begin with. It was a good class. But I think as the protocols got set up at the end, it, it just was not as traumatic. I think the first time it was, and there was a lot of sort of hand-holding, but not week four. I also, I mean, not unit four at near the end of the week. You know, I also was very surprised. I do want to tell you, as you saw, you're going to see later on, that they read 16 selections. <laughs> Right? And I did sort of the same thing for each selection, and I'll show you what I did. And I thought, like, um, I was just afraid to sort of back off a little bit and let them not do so much preparation, um, you know, to be able to discuss the readings. However, so I went right through, and they did the same thing for all 16. However, I do think in this last unit down here, um, this particular class did not need to do, they would have read it. They could have done it without so much prep from me. They really could have. Yeah, and I think next time I'll try backing off. But it may, it's the same for the written exams. I think they just didn't need, but I was afraid. I didn't want to dump them in, you know, into an exam. Um, I, I could have given them less prep, and they could have done the prep more themselves for exam four. They, they really could have. So I think I'm, that's going to be in my mind next time. I don't know if it'll work. I think so much depends on the class, too. So I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll have to handhold all the way through. Were the readings done outside of class? Yes. The readings were all done outside of class. Yeah, I'll show you that. All right. So this was the general flow of the course. Down here I listed, if you look each week, I have this thing that I called Reading Writing Workshop. I didn't call it that at the beginning. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to call it. Every, it seems like every course throughout the country has some sort of a supplemental something. Sometimes it's what they, they call it labs. Sometimes they call it something else. And it much depends on how the school is structured what, you know, and what resources are available at every college. So I had it called Reading Writing Workshop. Oh, at the end, I called it that. And it would be the time when I would do, or the class would do, any of these activities. Okay, and these are the ones that we did. Now, you have to remember that we met in this room, okay, twice a week. So I had some freedom 
and to use the resources. And Kevin came in, gave them an orientation. We used the laptops, we used the whiteboards. Um, but if you weren't meeting in this room, you could do other things, all right? It doesn't necessarily hinge on that. So that's why you see some, some of these things down here, technology related. Um, now, Kevin did come in and give us using the iPad, which was like one of the best lessons, I have to tell you, that you and I ever did. I really think it was good. And it he, he came in right around here. See this Unit 4 Media and Technology? It wasn't that I had planned it, but next semester I'm so going to plan it this way. And in this unit, there is the first article I assigned them, and again, it wasn't planned, was um, our, our iPods driving us all into isolation was the, kind of like the topic of the, of the article. So they had already read it, discussed it, and I didn't plan it. And then like a couple days later, Kevin, Kevin comes in with the iPad, and we had, he had like a really good discussion about the effects of technology with them. What they, and they were very well versed, and, and you gave a great discussion, impromptu, unplanned. It really was and, and, and I'm just standing there saying like, what? I didn't plan this. And yet they're having like this academic conversation with Kevin, who they knew but not really, about technology and the effect of technology and the iPads. And then we did sort of like a simple thing for them to use iPads. Um, but I, I think it was like a spontaneous thing that I really hope you can come in and do again, have it a little more planned. Um, but the other things that we did was conferencing, okay? You can do things like that, group work, mini lessons on skill-based things. You can do things like that in the reading, writing workshop. Now, I didn't plan a day for this, I really must tell you. It, I kind of had to see how the class was. So it's not like every Monday we have a workshop, because sometimes that didn't work out. We were in the middle of an essay. We were just prepping. The exam was going to be given or whatever. It wasn't like every Tuesday we have a workshop. So we were sort of, I was sort of fluid with which day or days would be this. And I think I would keep that and make that suggestion too because I don't think you can tell. It wasn't so, it was more integrated into the course and not broken out that, oh, here's a lab day, we're going to do this or it was all together there. So I don't know if you have any other questions on just sort of how the semester, I set it up, and it actually went this way. So. All right, the next thing that we have, and you certainly can use any of that information if you want, is what I'm going to do is just go out and give you some information that will help you plan, I think, any type of course like this and not specifically my course. So, oh, wait a minute, I wanna show you something first. Wait a minute. Before I start, where is this? <laughs> it's not in your, it's not in your, uh, is it gonna load up? It's not in your booklet. No. Oh. oh, there it is. So, before we start, um, and I give you so much information, some of you get so much information now, I just want to tell you that, those of you that know me, I do do yoga, so lots of times I take yoga breaths, yoga breaths, <laughs> yoga breaths before on a Wednesday night when I'm saying like, I don't know what I'm doing on Thursday, I gotta make up the, take a yoga breath, it will come. And then this right here, a young, a young teacher who's um, a friend of my daughter-in-law who teaches in Rhode Island, not my daughter-in-law, but the friend teaches in Rhode Island, um, sent me that. And, and you know, with her teaching experience, she teaches in the elementary schools, and I thought that was cute too. So it, you sort of have to give yourself, I know, some breathing room, right, to, to do that. Anyway, so what I have here next is um, what I thought the graphic could give us is a d design of any type of theme-based unit. All right, not necessarily mine particularly, but any type of theme-based unit, and I have four reading selections sort of in the graphic. You could have two. You could have a couple of chapters from a book. It's not like it has to be a reading selection. So this is how I organized it, and I think would be good to think about that. So you have to have your theme-based unit, and you have to think of the theme. If the book gives you the theme, you're going to use a reader, then you would select it. If you, lots of people, 
um, made their own themes up. All right, and I know that some people at ALP had one book, a book, and it, we have a one book too, and I don't think Betsy's going to use that one book. Um, maybe I'll use selections of it, I'm not sure. But other people at, you know, that do it in California particularly chose a book, and they based their theme on that book and you know, gave supplemental readings to it. So um, I think to think of the material and the theme that you want first. Then over here, what I think of are those things that drive, uh, drove what I would think of at, when I was trying to think of my lessons. So we have the learning outcomes, the guiding principles, the end assessments, and the big picture questions that Janine helped um, me think about. And so I'm going to show you actually what one looked like in a minute. Um, and the big picture questions for the theme unit would be things, questions that you want the students to discuss and think about and ultimately write about. Not what's the main idea of the reading selection, but overriding questions that tie together the unit. So like for the media unit, Kevin sort of was helping me develop that. What's the effect of media and technology on our lives, good and bad? So when I did that unit, that was sort of one of the ideas that I had overriding. And the reading selections would help us discuss and ultimately write on that. So that, I think, is, will keep you from always doing skills-based, because a skills-based course isn't really designed that way. You know, this is also not a lit class, all right? So all the things that I taught and the ones that were taught that I, are nonfiction, you know, they're not literature-based. I didn't see any literature. They used a book. It was a biography, an autobiography, a collection of essays, things like that. So I just want to sing Linda's praises and talk about her essential questions. because Those were Janine's essential oh, questions. I had to make them up, yeah. These questions, and these are such good questions. And are you making them up each time? And, and she was, and they were they were I think really it helped essential. the students very much, don't you think <laughs> they so? They did because they tied all the readings in that unit together. And so students would be asking these same questions about for each. four different yeah. readings. And they'd start to relate things. They and did. They'd interact with the readings they in, did. A, in a really more complex way. Yes. And they were an important part. Yes, they were. And I think it helped the students by giving them in the beginning, and again, I'll sh I have one in there, uh, an actual one I did for one of the units. It helped the students know what you wanted them to know. I mean, sometimes students are lost, you know, like, what does she want from me? And okay, so they know from day one, whatever the unit day is, these are the questions you're going to write on. These are the questions I'm going to ask you for the in-class essay. And these are the questions that we're going to discuss in each selection. So I think it helped them, don't you think, sort of ease that anxiety of, how am I ever going to do this? I don't know, blah, blah, blah. So, but there can be any questions that you make up. I did get some of my questions from intro the introduction to each unit in the book here. You know, like you had like a little introduction and I would sometimes draw them out of there. But you could make up any of your questions. Anyway, so once you do that and have that sort of in your mind, I have around the corner here four reading selections just because I chose to do that. Again, you can choose whatever you want. And then as I planned exactly what I would do with each reading selection, I think I kept in mind this, that it was reading and writing skills integrated. So to think of things to do that would do that. And to keep my workshop in mind, because I did have one or two days that I could do other things like that. And that to remember that if I needed other support services, that to try to reach out and get that, like Kevin coming in and um, asking for Craig. I didn't have him at the beginning of the semester. And then Tom and Debbie facilitated that. So to, to, to give them the support needed to do it. And then their anxiety, I think, goes down, don't you think so, considerably when they know uh, she's not just going to give me some essay to write as they do it. I'm going to be able to draft it in the room. Craig will be there. Kelly will be there, um, you know, her tutors. And, and I will be able to do this because it's going to work out that way. And I'm not going to be wandering around the hall trying to find the writing center. You know, um, I think that just considerably helped. 
So how about any questions on that? I hope that's a little helpful because I didn't, I'm going to show you how I actually did one, me, but I think that there's so much variety that teachers can do. I thought to give a template was more useful to you because you might want to do other things. Did you want to say something, Tom? Oh, okay. How about, do you have any comments or other questions on that? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We'll wait and see. I'm not sure, Fair. It's been a long time since I taught a course for the first time. I'm elderly, but. Um, I don't know. Maybe Ste Betsy sat in my class once, you know, every Wednesday. She was there. And sometimes I, she was my tutor. I'd say, Betsy, can you come help, you know, uh, Luce? So they'd be like, oh, yeah, Betsy. Yeah. So um, I don't know. You know, it may be, certainly part of it was this the first time I taught it. And I think having them for six hours sort of puts this thing on you that you have to make sure you're giving them instruction that's worthwhile, you know, sort of like a little bit of a pressure. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see second time around if it's, different. I'm not going to plan that it's different, and if it turns out to be, I'll be, be so happy. I think, you know, the important message that I'm getting is just to allow yourself to be flexible with yeah. it. You might find that you can follow your plan, and you might find that you can't follow your plan. And if that's hard for you, that's a, maybe not so much. But, if it, you know, joke about this, but I mean, Linda, I think you're such an organized Person. Well, think of that. Okay, so those of you that know me, and I'm telling you that I felt disorganized and couldn't follow my plan, just sort of keep that in mind that maybe what you have to sort of work through in order to teach the course and get the student services. In there. That's such a nice thing to know before you teach the course. Yeah, yeah. take the yoga so breath. You know, right. you you know, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm losing my footing a little. Yeah, I need to definitely. Back up and I think that's really yes, hard. that's where I went back to the guiding principles. Of course, I had the group to talk it through with, and I had Betsy every Wednesday to talk it through with. So I did have to back up and just sort of regroup and then move forward because what else, you know, what else was there to do? Yes. Thank that. goodness, huh? You have 15 I know. I know. And the challenges of that kind of individual diagnostic piece that I mean it helps that you have the support yes. in the room and right. using some of that support. I know. Well, I don't know, Sally, how that will go. We'll see this semester yeah. with a larger group um, uh, if how I, how that works out, how to break it up. I I don't know. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. Hopefully I'll get some support already built in maybe when we start, but I don't know. Uh, if we meet in this room, we can work in groups and things like that, but I'm not sure. So we'll have to address that as it comes, and maybe some of you are teaching it in the fall too. Yeah, and I think we're going to try to meet and so we can discuss those types of things to see. I don't know how that will work. Um, were the written assignments always done on um um, I'll show you, there were different types of written assignments. The essays were all typed MLA typed. And how do you manage with um, the students that are not computer literate? They have to become computer literate. Yeah, yeah. But I found in my classes they, they, re they readily use that as an excuse. Well, I know. <laughs> not accepted. I know, not accepted. <laughs> and in fact, I know that some of you um, don't take um, first drafts handwritten, right? So I'm going to um, this semester um, not take first drafts handwritten. Yeah. Typed first drafts. You know, when they handwrite a first draft, it makes it difficult to do peer editing because they can't read each other's handwriting and, eh, what did he write? So I'm going to try that also. But there's no teacher in the school that takes handwritten essays that just don't take it, so let's learn. I, I do want to tell you, again, and it was because I was in this room, um, 
Kevin and other people, Craig was very good at this too, that was part of the course workshop um, that they learned, oh, you know, and I don't know, they learned how to use Word more effectively, they learned how to save documents, they learned how to go into Dropbox, and Deb got some money to give them a flash drive that they could use. Oh my God, you might think we gave them gold fun. Yeah. And they used that flash drive. I'll take out my flash drive. I have it on my flash drive. And it was this little blue flash drive, it said BCC or whatever. So I, I don't know how to address that if it's not in this room. But it's a desperate need for these students to be able to use technology as a learning tool. I also do want to tell you, because I was in this room, I also was able to use things. And I want to tell you, they do not know how to use e-learning. They don't know how to use it. Craig was very helpful again with that, because he sort of gave them a little lecture which, of course, they listen to him, not me, right? You've got to learn how to do this because you need to take an online course when you're in BCC. And so I'm going to teach you how to use e-learning. I'm like, okay, Greg. So he taught them how to use e-learning. They were, began posting. I put some discussion board posting. They would do it in the room, though, with the laptops. Um, you know, it's like the digital divide, which we talked about when, we, when Kevin was in the room. We can't let them be on the other side of the divide because that's where they are when they come in. So it just happened that I think they're so much more prepared, those students, to go to English 101 or any other course because of this issue that we were able to address. Well, I don't know if we overcome it. We I began to address it. It's just the beginning. Well, indeed, I was double checking. I remember us talking about this when we were working on this course proposal, that we wanted instructional technology in the objective. Yes, we put it in we there. Because thought it was that crucial for students who were completely computer illiterate or just not really computer they illiterate. Uh, they weren't them, illiterate. Them, yeah, but they weren't using it really, well. You know, they but, weren't um, using it well. I would say if you can't teach in a computer lab to try to reserve a couple, like maybe in the beginning when they're writing their first essays, one or two classes and allowed on campus to. Maybe I know it's I, a I difficult issue on this lab and this co campus because we don't have enough of these rooms, you know, for us. But it's an issue that is in yes. this course. It needs to be addressed. It is not going away, and they are not prepared to use technology efficiently or quickly to proceed into college-level courses easily. They just really aren't. Well, economically, some students. Number one, they don't have computers at home, and even if they have, like, they, they don't have enough money for an internet connection. I didn't okay. ask them to do anything at home that no. required that. Nope. They did it here. They always, as you know, they can use the library I've computers and I things know. like that. It's but the, the issue was that the good thing here was that I didn't just give that to them. I just didn't say go type it. Mm. I didn't say here's the MLA rules. Good. <laughs> Off you go. They did it here, yes. and Craig watched them, and I watched them, and Kevin watched them, and we said, no, blah, blah, blah. I do want to tell you a funny story about Jose and the MLA rules. So, I don't know, Jose, they liked this little table over here, and they all sat together. So Jose's typing one of the essays, I don't remember which one it was, and um, he's, you know, Ms. Murray, can you come over here and look at it? So I'm, I'm trying to see it, right, from standing up and like, I said to him, oh, Jose, you're going to have to make the font bigger because I have old eyes, you know. So he looks at me and he looks at me. So he makes the font bigger on the screen <laughs> to make me read it. And I go, oh, thank you. Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we do a thing. And then the next day he brings in his final copy. And MLA is like 12 font, right? So he, it's like this huge <laughs> font all the way down the paper. And I said, Jose, it's 12 font. It's 12 font. And he said, like, I did that for you. And I said, why? He goes, because you can't read 12 font. And I said, like, and they all thought, like, oh, isn't he nice? And they're like, and I'm like, I said, no, no, don't worry about me. I said, you go back and change that to 12 font, and don't ever do that again. He said, I was just trying to help you out. So I said, I'll use a magnifying glass if I'm at home and I can't read your paper, but that was funny. Yeah, that's my story, but he was really funny. But it is an issue, I, you know, that we have to address. Yeah, he would do that. Right? Um, 
All right, so what, what I have here is, again, sort of another template, and then um, I'll show you an actual, what I actually did, okay, in one unit. But I thought, again, to give you sort of a template that we could discuss about how to actually use a reading selection, whatever it was, you know, the length, it didn't matter, um, in the room and what I actually did with the reading selection in the room. So you got to remember, I did four, four short ones per unit. So I do want to tell you that I did this for 16 selections, all right? And we would spend one class period. Now, it may run over to another class period and maybe not, okay? It kind of depended, but one period was sufficient to get this all done, all right? So you're not spending a lot of time. So if I have the reading selection here, what I did was uh, over there, as some of you asked, did they do it at home? The reading selection, I had home, a homework assignment. And what I did for homework assignment was actually give them a variety of things to do. All right, for each reading. And where it says pre-reading, pre-read, of course, before we had talked about the reading process, it's in the book, and we had discussed that the first week, um, as pre-reading being a part of the reading process. Pre-reading, sometimes, uh, most of the time, we would do in the room. Um, and it might be, yes, discussing the title of the article before they read it. And, and discussing the, how it fit into the unit for a few minutes. I do want to tell you, Viewpoints does give two pre-reading written questions, so they would do that at home, you know. Um, and I do think that they might have been able to do that, again, like I said, without my assistance at the end of the course. I think they just would have done it, but I continued to do it. A lot of the pre-reading came, a lot of good discussion came from that if you want to know the truth. So, you know, if we were discussing media and our effect on our lives, and that was the title of the article, they had a lot to say about it before they even read the article. So that was a good thing. We always did that. Then I did vocabulary building activities, um, as Diane asked. Um, what I did, because I want to tell you the students asked for it, the viewpoints pulls out vocabulary words for me for each article. Now, maybe if you don't have a book like that, you could do it yourself. And they range anywhere, when you look at the book, anywhere from four words to seven words. They pull out the words, put them in the front. A lot of readers do this. Tell you the paragraph it's in, give the student a definition. So what I told them, again, this is the first time around, and I didn't want to make things complicated for me or them, not knowing how it would all work out, is I told them for the vocabulary building activity at home to pick five of the words that the book had given them, there were m m more than five, underline it in the article and on a piece of paper write a sentence um, that they would create demonstrating the meaning of that word. That, that was all I asked them to do. Now, the second time around, I think I could give them an option, because this worked very well, um, to say like five of the regular words or four of theirs and one of yours. If you want to have some word that you don't know that the book didn't list, feel free, list them, as long as you have a certain number. Or I could be a little bit varied with that. Now, it sounds like that would just sort of end it, but it really didn't, because a lot of the vocabulary words that the book picked out were words that held the meaning of the article. So by doing that, and then asking questions about the word when they came back, we got into what the article meant. And I'll give you an example. It's one article was, the internet is not the panacea for the future, was the title. Panacea was one of the words. So we had, after they did the homework, a discussion about panacea and what did it mean and how did it relate, where did it came from. So although it wasn't formal vocabulary instruction, I think they got a lot out of it, they understood it, and it was like a better way. And you know, you could do other things. So say you, we did do some vocabulary building um, mini lessons. They were interested in using dictionaries. I don't know why. So we used electronic dictionaries to find meanings of words, like in one of those sort of workshop areas, because they were sort of asking for it. We also could just use, do exercises about dictionary use. In, in different ways. So I think you can sort of go off. We also did words in context. I know Betsy saw me do that once. Um, a, a general lesson about how to find words in context, not about these specific words, but okay, we use these, now let me give you others 
do you know and so this is what it's called this is how you do it and not making a big deal about it but doing it for 20 minutes and and then moving on so that's how I handled vocabulary the vocabulary came back on the final exam so and, and on the exams I should have to that know what you think about that but I didn't have a separate vocabulary book you could do a lot of different things you could have them keep their own vocabulary book I know that Betsy talked about doing that maybe you could do different things you know that you want if to, to do vocabulary development I don't know what you want. so they did that for homework then they would also read obviously and annotate so they had to annotate it, the article and, by, and we had, of course, given them instruction the first couple of weeks about that. The, this book does give instruction and examples. So underline marginal notes for every article. And they would do that at home. Then they also answered comprehension questions in writing. Again, I just used viewpoints questions. They're at the back. They give more than you need. But the first five, I usually just base a comprehension and they just numbered one through five on the same paper with the vocabulary and they just answered the question um, in a couple sentences whatever it's no big deal so that's what they came into the classroom with and they did that at home um, now when they came into the classroom with the reading selection I would give um, a quiz at the beginning of the class now I my thought was as you know, some of you know me. <laughs> no homework, no quiz. So I thought like, oh, I'm gonna do that. But it just didn't really work out that way because I said, okay, give me your homework and then I'll give you the quiz. And they said to me, um, but we wanna keep the article because we're gonna discuss it later on. And I wanna make some more notes and I wanna look at it. And you know what, they were right. They were right. I, I couldn't collect the homework and give them the quiz because then they wouldn't have the article. So and, uh, Janine discussed this in her workshop of how to handle someone who doesn't do their homework. And I don't know if there's a good answer for you. Um, to tell you the truth, I had a good class and all but one student really did their homework. Uh, and so what I did was, okay, at the begin for the first five or six weeks, put, put your article away, everybody just takes the quiz. And the quiz told me whether they did the homework or not, sort of, okay? And that's how I handled it. Now, it did get to a point where this one young man <laughs> didn't do it, didn't do it, didn't do it. So Janine did have a suggestion, which I did, um, and I don't know if I'd have to employ that more, was that, okay, everyone's going to show me the homework, and if you didn't do it, sit at the back, and you don't take the quiz, and you, do the, and you read the article, and you don't participate in the discussion. And a lot of the people in Janine's workshop this week, past week, also did things like that. So I don't know how I would handle it in a large class. I'm sure I'd get more than one person. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It's sort of a difficult thing we all kind of try to deal with as far as making it fair for everybody, motivating them to do the homework, yet not letting somebody who didn't do the homework consistently participate in the good stuff. You know, um, it's somewhat not fair for them to do that. So did you uh, institute your policy like you had one week to make up the quiz? Because otherwise it's no makeups. No makeups. No quiz makeups. Take it, don't take it. You have to remember we took 16 quizzes. Yeah, 16 quizzes. And I would say I would drop two. I could really have dropped three. You know, it wasn't like they were really going to do that. So there's no makeup on the quizzes, no. I think the danger in this, the one problematic student you had <clears throat> is they're reading. A lot of what they're reading, you could talk about whether you read it or not. Right. There are issues in today's world. Right. And, so you'll get students who will, even if they didn't do the reading, try to participate in the in the discussion and right. take it off track because right. they're not yep. relating it to the reading. And Yet they're smart you, enough so they have a little background knowledge in medical marijuana. Yeah. Yes. So Bessie and, and I discussed talking. this because she saw the student doing this. <coughs> Yet yeah. he didn't actually read the essay to actually be able to point to it. Yet he could talk about medical marijuana not relating to the article. So. It's problematic, I don't know. All right, so they would take the quiz, and I'll give you an example of the quiz. Again, I based my quizzes on what Janine had advised. Um, 
Then in the after the quiz, these are the activities. We might do all of them. We might do some of them. I would sort of decide maybe sometimes on the fly what I might want to do depending on the quizzes or how they felt or what I thought they knew or didn't. We could certainly review the quiz, which is frequently what they wanted to do, you know, and that would ensue a discussion, you know, by the quiz questions. We also could do some whole class activity that I thought might go well. I don't know. I, sometimes we um, discuss the main idea. Sometimes they had questions on the homework. You know, I, we could do something like that. I did have them take notes, and I'll show you, I'll send, you know, like a sheet where I actually did that. I think that's kind of like a good habit to get them into. <laughs> and, and, you know, some of you know that I go like, I look, you know, they go like, okay, take notes, and then they'll look, ooh. So then I go around, you know, like, which book, which book, take your note, take your note. Yeah, Betsy's laughing, and Debbie's laughing. <laughs> Write this down, and I wait, and they all look at me, okay. So, but I think just to model it and have them used to, even if it's four lines. Do you know what I mean? We used to always put the title in the author, and then we would state the main idea. That's what we did for everything. And we would train them on how to state the main idea. We had good discussions where to find the main idea. It wasn't in a paragraph, sometimes unstated. We had lots of good discussions as we went on on how to find main idea in longer articles, but we would always do that first. And then whatever other notes they might feel would be um, good about the article. And they were wide and varied. All right, so something I might want to think that they would take notes and discuss when I got in there, they had confusion about something else. So we kind of had to switch. But they were things like what was the rhetorical devices being used. I do want to tell you, without using that term, they had those discussions. Okay, was the article narrative? Was it expository? Was it research? Was it, they did. Now, I didn't use rhetorical device, but what made this easier to read? It's a narrative. Where's the main idea of the narrative? Oh, well, I don't know. Maybe it's not here. We have to figure it out. Let's find it. So as the course went on, they got good at that, and we did take notes on that. Then you could do small group activities, and I tried that. Of course, the class you saw was so small, and they were very connected. So they didn't want to do small group activities because they wanted to work all together. But I did like kind of try to make them. But in a larger class, you know, you would separate out and do some sort of activity. You could do whatever you wanted to do. So um, the other thing that we would do was this writing response, and I would do that. 15 minutes, I was in this room and I would look at the clock way I'm looking at it now. Um, 15 minutes, what time is the break? Is it a quarter of? Yep. Okay. So 15 minutes and um, I would stop, give them 15 minutes, take out a piece of paper and write a response to a question that maybe had come up in the discussion. Now I would go into the class thinking of something, but if the discussion had something else that came up, I would write that on the board and they would write on it for 15 minutes. 15 minutes, that's it. Hand write, write. And then it would be a paragraph looking like a paragraph and then they would hand that in to me and I would keep them. Usually I tried to have the question be something I was going to ask on the final exam, although I didn't really know, or something they were going to use in the essay, although now I'll be able to plan that a lot more carefully. But, or something they found interesting too, I just didn't really you know, have an exact thing that they wrote. But if I forgot the writing response, they would say, oh, we didn't do the writing response. You know, it was enough time. Should we do it tomorrow? Can we do it for homework? So they didn't write 16 of them. I do want to tell you, I think, just because it was sort of not time. Some, I think they wrote like 10 or 11 of them. You know, they didn't write everyone. How about any quick comments on something like that? I think you could use that for anything that you wanted, that sort of model. Hmm? What did you do with them when you collected them? The writing responses, I graded check. Okay. Check, 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 check. And then at the end of the unit, if I thought they were going to be, well, I always gave them back. If they were going to be useful for the essay I would assign, I would give that back the day they assigned the essay. If I thought it was going to be useful for them to study for the unit exam, I would give them back that day. But I didn't grade the writing responses, like a journal. You know, just check, check, check. But they did it in the room as like the end of the lesson. 
Linda, um, and maybe that's you could answer this better. Looking at the schedule, do you think it was better having it four days a week or two? I don't know, because I taught it four. I'm going to teach it four again. I'm a little scared to teach it. Betsy's going to try a different. I don't know. He, she didn't do it yet. She sat in on my class, but she is going to do it. I don't know. So you'd have to probably like do two of the articles a day. Well, when you think about it, you've got about an article, maybe two sometimes. Oh, no. So, you know, I don't, I don't think you'd have, you don't, you're not doing an article each class necessarily. Um, I kind of look at it as an article a week. Um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be more pressure on me to um, really divide up the class in a lot of different activities to keep them. I like it as with any once a week, you know, once a week class, mm -hmm. twice a week. I liked, I liked the time frame of Linda's class, though. I think the hour 15 minutes worked well for the students. Well, I don't know. If I had to teach it for three hours, you'd just work out a different pace. Yeah. That pace there that I showed you with that lesson was very use, very helpful for them. They didn't feel rushed. I didn't feel rushed. It was enough to get everything done, yet we didn't linger, you know, too much and moved on to the next thing. It was for an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes, whatever. It was fine. It was good. I think, you know, it's, it's a tricky question because I, I could imagine how teaching it in smaller chunks, you know, over four days, might be better for everyone in some ways, right? Might be difficult on a faculty member's schedule, but as far as, you know, um, dealing with the material and, and keeping things moving, that might work. I would say in terms of registration, the twice a week um, courses seem to fill up quicker. Do they? So, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see sort of how all, yeah. you know, we're really, we're really still new in this process. Yeah. You know, we'll see. As long as, as long as it all sort of comes out in the wash, I, don't, I think people will have that opportunity to make a choice in what works best for them. I think especially if you can be in a computer lab, the longer amount of time is great. Because they're mm -hmm. they can very happy to trash. Yeah. They can really be circling around and giving lots of feedback. Mm -hmm. I think it might be harder if they're working by hand, but it could still happen. I don't know. How yeah. many years did we do that? Yeah. <laughs> right? so. mm -hmm. Um. Do you want me to keep going? You want to take a break now? Is this sort of where you saw the break well, I thought I did. I have an actual unit to show them um, of an actual unit that I did. Do you think it'll go over five minutes? Uh, I could talk fast if you want me to. <laughs> I think it would be better just to show them the unit and then we'll take a break and then do the student writing there. So we'll, I'm going to go kind of quickly, but just for your own benefit, should you want to use this, feel free. If you don't, that's fine too. But here's the actual unit, okay, of unit three, which was social concerns. So I told you that I gave them the essential questions the first day we started the unit. There they are, viewpoints, there are the readings with the page numbers so that if they wanted to read ahead or whatever they wanted to do, they had it the first day. As I told you, some people give dates right here, but I didn't because it didn't work out that way. So it was just sort of um, telling them what to do. So there's the actual handout. Um, the other thing that I gave, the next thing is the actual um, things that I did, right? We have unit three. Here it is. Okay, so, oops, what do I have? Is that the one I have next? Yes. So what I have there, I think I gave, Debbie sent you this particular article, um, and you're going to see a student writing on this article, okay, when we get back from the break, Moose's handouts. So this particular thing is the actual lesson that I did on this particular, do you have that? No? Yeah. The actual lesson that we did on this particular evil weed or useful drug article and actually what I actually did. Um, the classroom activities that we did, this one was on the use of medical marijuana, which was so timely. I do want to tell you it didn't make it that way, but it was because Massachusetts is implementing this law and was as we were speaking. So we would, somebody asked that, we got the computers out, we found the government website, and we you know, did some reading about where Massachusetts is on this law, and the article told that. So, I gave the quiz, this one particularly, we, we were talking about MLA formatting in the writing response, and I did that. Um, the next one that you have is an actual quiz, all right, that I gave in that particular unit. 
Um, it says quiz on quiz 10. And this is, these are the questions that I asked. So if you want to just actually see what kind of questions were asked on those 16 quizzes, it was two questions, um, 50 points each. They answered right here uh, on the paper. And it says to write two or three sentences. It took maybe 10 or 15, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and that's what I graded for the quiz, just like that. The questions wanted to be based on the article so that they, somebody like that student that Betsy and I knew um, couldn't answer the question very well without actually having read the article. All right, the next thing I have is talk about the exam, because some of you asked me for that. So I'm just going to show you that, and then maybe we'll, we'll stop and let you look at the rest of it here. Um, the ex in-class exam prep sheet all right, is here. Now, this is something that um, Janine told me to do, and I said to her, I didn't say to her, <laughs> I said to myself, that's stupid, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give them notes and then let them take an exam looking at the notes. And so, but then I thought, oh, I shouldn't ignore what she's telling me because she's been doing this a lot longer than I have. So for the first unit, I did this, where they got the actual exam questions, and then we had reading selection. When I pushed this down for you, but it went on, you know, I gave them lots of room. And we had a day where we reviewed all four selections in the room. They could write whatever they wanted on this sheet, and then they used this sheet to write the exam. And it was perfection because she was right. She was right. They, the questions on the exam, which is the next handout, were not their opinion, okay? They were questions based on the reading. And they were so anxious, am I gonna remember what I read? Now she's gonna ask me to write an essay. And this sort of, again, just lowered the anxiety level so much. They didn't know the exact questions. Because, look, I, I've expanded them greatly, and they have to answer two out of the three. They don't have to answer all three. They have to use two, you know, each, each question has to have a different reading selection. And they looked at these notes. It made them feel better. You know, they knew the article title and the author, the main idea they could write. But if you look at the questions, that I don't ask them what's the main idea. So they just had that, and they used it, and I continued doing it, and I would... Um, continue doing that if I were you. Also, if you just quickly look at the, at the in-class, end of in-class exam, is where the vocabulary came back. So I did test them on the vocabulary as 20 points on the exam, because they wanted me to do that for them. So I let them pick their own words. So what I said was, well, you have five words from each article, right? That would be a total of 20. Um, here's a piece of blank paper right now, like three days before the exam. Get out your words, look, at them, look them over in class, and you list five. Any five you want that I'm going to test you on. And they would list five, and then they'd mark five, and then I'd take the blank sheet, and then I, not, they couldn't look at their notes. I would give them back the exam on exam day. They'd fill in their five, write their sentence for their five. So they chose the five they wanted to be tested on. And again, anxiety went down. I didn't have to make up a test. They did the test, right? And it worked well. Okay, and the last thing before we take our break, what I'll, I'll, last couple of things, and I'll just let you look at that because it's so much information here, is an actual exam question answered. All right, it's kind of a compilation, but it says unit three, sample student answered. So you would see what a student writing actually looked like. This would have been handwritten, of course, but um, I think this would be more like what Luce would write, and we did that there. Uh, and the last thing, if you want to use it again, is sort of just unit three, week by week, with a more detailed breakdown of actually how the unit went day by day. So is that a lot of teacher information for you? Um, and how it actually went and how I did it. So I think unless you have some other questions, what we can do is take a break, and then I think when we come back, what I think we could do is look at the, the writing that came out of this Unit 3, and then do a, like a little activity on the writing assignment itself. The, I gave you a sample. I just had a quick question on the, um, I wasn't quite clear. The 
first draft, they do that in class on the laptops or um, No, they would not do the whole draft. I, I didn't have the time for them to do the whole draft. But I teach that very much like I do with the standalone English 090. They would always begin it. Many of them obviously always got the thesis statement for me. Many of them would begin the introduction. Sometimes they'd have like an outline of what they wanted to do. And then they would go and write what they could do. Remember, I met them four days in a row. So they would have to come back the next day with something. And sometimes it wouldn't be the whole thing because it was like, you know, sometimes they just didn't have that time. But they would come back with something. Now, some of them at the end of the semester did start drafting actually on the computer. But I think that's a big step because most of them still hand wrote the draft. So they would not write the whole draft. I didn't have enough time to do that. But they would have a date when the draft was due. And we would work at least one whole period on drafting, sometimes one and a half. But that still wouldn't get them the whole draft. I can't remember. Did you collect or draft comment, give them back? Or yes. Did you more of a commenting I did both. I did have a date where they had to give me the rough draft, the first draft, mm -hmm. and I collected them and I wrote comments and gave them back and conferenced and then they, you know, did that. But as we were going, we also were, you know, were making comments and helping with the draft. But I did stick to that just to be sure everyone had a draft in on the right, on a day that would be the same for everybody. 